Today we're in Atlanta, Georgia to talk to a man who's been collecting watches for over 20 years. 16 years ago, he began a website called On The Dash, which has since become the go-to source for everything Hoyer. He's a watch collector, he's a practicing attorney, his name is Jeff Stein, and today we're talking watches. So Jeff, thank you so much for uh, appearing here on Talking Watches with us today. Absolutely, glad to be here. So you and I have known each other, we figured out just before since middle of 2009. And why did I contact you in 2009? You were having some kind of questions, issues, angst about a vintage Hoyer Camaro. It was white and it had two registers. That's all I remember. That's exactly right. And so that's the type of email that you probably receive how many times a day as the owner of On The Dash? Right now, it's probably four or five a day. Per day. Somebody just asking, is this watch right? Just some inquiry from the public. And that's what you were. You were just a face in the crowd. Who's this guy been, and why is he worried about his, uh, his Camaro? So, so you're a little different than, than most of the you know, kind of horological academics in that you actually collect to support the learning about, about each watch which explains a fair amount of this collection. I'll, I'll find myself writing about a particular watch, and then in exploring the history, I'll end up buying a few, borrowing a few, just to support the posting and to just experience the watch. And, and it, it seems that, that you know, a lot of the watches we see here are really kind of the chronological ascension of Hoyer. So we start over here in the 1930s. Right. And what are these two watches over here? Those are, they're called Fliegers, and they're two register pilot's watches. The one you're holding came a little bit later. It's a two button, two pusher model. So that's really where my collection starts in the mid 1930s. Sure. And then from there we go to the Octavius? Well, we've got a little area there with some Hoyers from the 40s and 50s. Mm -hmm. Hoyer did well with the triple calendars. Here are a couple of 40s, three register chronographs, very early Valcho 72. 1950s, they were doing a lot with Abercrombie and Fitch back then. Mm -hmm. So fair number of seafarers and some plain three register chronographs, Valjo 71, Valjo 72. And so then from there we jump into the, the Octavia. Exactly. It seems like you have more Octavias than any other model. Over the years, my collecting has kind of shifted that direction. This is the first one I bought, probably not this exact piece, but a model like this, probably around 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. And over time, I think I've probably owned just about every model that Hoyer has made. Let's run through a few of the, the special. Attendees. Okay. So what are these two guys here? Those two collectors call them big subs. The first Autavias had larger registers than the subsequent ones. And then within the big subs, there are the Dauphine hands, the all loom Dauphine hands, and the steel edge hands. Those two that you have are the all loom hands and the big subs. So those are the very first Autavias. And potentially the most desirable, I would say. I think so. It was a time when the Autavias were behind the Monaco's sure. in terms of value, but they've really taken off over the last couple of years and those are the ones everybody wants. And this is another special one. Right, this one was about a year ago and collectors refer to it as the All Loom Autavia. Most of the watches you see there either have applied metal markers or the very early ones have painted loom and numerals. We've seen a handful that don't have the applied markers. They only have the rectangular loom. So this one appeared on eBay and I was able to contact the seller and she stood outside and looked at it from every angle and she didn't know what markers were, or she didn't know what applied markers were, but she convinced me that it was all loom and I convinced her to sell it to me. And there was some, some pretty intense negotiating on this one, I've heard. We were talking by phone and she said, no, I know what I've got. I saw that on the Dash website and I know what this watch is worth. So then she named her number and I said, fine, you know, I'll pay that, I'll pay what it's worth. And she had no idea that you actually owned On The Dash. Correct. When she said, you know, I know what it's worth, I've read On The Dash, I've, I've heard that a few times. <laughs> a 
before we jump into the, the self-winding chronographs that kind of made Hoyer who they are in some ways, let's talk a little bit about the other manually winding chronographs of, of the 60s. So tell us a little bit about these Carreras. I've got a very early white on white and a very early black on black. These to me are, you know, the origin of the species. These are the ones that Jack Hoyer designed and named, and many people think of this as the perfect design of a chronograph. It's so clean and so simple. And Camaros, one of kind of the, the little stepchild of the, the chronograph uh, Hoyer world. Seems to be that Camaros, for some reason, have not historically gotten too much respect. I actually like these. I like them more now than I used to, but just haven't collected that many of them. So I have the three register, and then there is a two register that Hoyer made for Zodiac in a gold-plated model. So then jumping into the self-winding watches, the watch that I would say is most commonly referred to as the first self-winding watch, even though we know they all came out at the same time, is the Monaco. So what are these two guys? This one is a chronomatic, meaning it was one of the first very first series that was issued as an automatic chronograph. Collectors refer to this one as the paintless wonder. This was midnight blue, just like all the other Monaco's, but somehow the paint disintegrated. This was an eBay find probably six or eight years ago. It was unclaimed property in a bank safe deposit box. Sure, and, and this is really arguably one of the holy grails of, of Hoyer collecting. Anything with the word chronomatic on the dial, you know, you, you make sure it's genuine, you buy it, and those are the grails. Yeah, and the other grail in the Monaco world is this guy. This is interesting. I mean, a raging debate in the Hoyer world for a long time about whether or not Hoyer produced these. People refer to it as a black PVD. The finish is not actually PVD because they didn't have that technology then. but. It's now pretty well concluded that Hoyer made these, but a very limited number of them, and there were a lot of sort of parts and cases floating around mm -hmm. and appearing in strange places in different conditions. There are a couple of idiosyncrasies here. The 12 and the 6 are higher. They're not lined up with the other numerals. That's a sign that it's an authentic dial. And then there's also a typo in the reference number. And then we see from there an enormous, really, collection of automatic Octavias. And the very first one is a chronomatic. Correct. This one, the collector that had this, he was in Brazil, and he wouldn't sell it. He would only trade it. And he wanted to trade it for a Bund. So I began making phone calls, scouring eBay, and sent him the Bund. He sent me the Chronomatic, and there we go. And then we have an enormous, really, progression of Octavius. So what's the next one here? I mean, this gets kind of technical, the early Octavias. They're all reference 1163, which is the lower case. They all have 36912 on the hour recorder as opposed to the later one through 12. The difference, believe it or not, between these two watches is the base of the V in the word Octavia. This one is flat and this one is pointed. So that means this one is earlier and this one is later. And as in so many of these watches, the one people tend to chase and yeah. feel good about is the earlier one. And that one arrived yesterday. So to see whether that V was flat or pointed was just one of the highlights of yesterday. Sure. And then we go into several other variations of, of really a very similar watch. Very, very similar. You know, the one that put Hoyer on the map was the Viceroy. 1163, sold for $88 if you sent in proof of purchase of 10 packs of Viceroy cigarettes. So $200 watch, which is what the others were selling for at the time, it was for $88. Mm -hmm. This one is kind of interesting. It's engraved Parnelli Jones 1970-71 Champs racing team. Vell's Parnelli Jones was the racing team that won, I believe it was called USAC, indie style racing, two years in a row. One more that 
collectors are very interested in. This one is called the Orange Boy, and it is identical to the Viceroy, except every accent that's red is orange on this one. Fairly rare, maybe we see 10 or 12 of these a year. So something that, that isn't maybe as well known by, by most average watch collectors is that similar to the way that, that Rolex made some Mariners for the British military, Tudor for the, the Marine Nationale, Hoyer actually made chronographs for a few different military forces. Correct, and what I've got here in the 70s era Octavias, there are three that were issued to the Israel Defense Forces. This is the last of the three, and the marking on the back this is the correct marking for the equivalent of Navy SEALs in the Israel Defense Forces. Something else that's gotten a fair amount of attention lately, just because a trove of them emerged, this one was issued to the Kenyan Air Force. This, again, is, is sort of mid-70s. It's got a military marking on the back, KAF, Kenya Air Force. And I think that that kind of references or alludes to the fact that, that Hoyer was truly a, a tool maker at the core of it. And we see so many dashboard timers here on the table. Well, we'll go to this one since it's in the neighborhood. The story that came with this one, and I've never really sought to prove it or validate it, is that this pair was in the control tower of the airport in Geneva, Switzerland in the 1930s. So this is my earliest pair of dashboard timers and this is the Ottavia that 30 years later became a chronograph. This set of timers I bought on eBay. I wanna say it was at least 10 years ago. And in this photograph, this is the car owner, chief mechanic, his name was Isert. This set was used at Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the mid 1960s. The sticker here converts a time on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway into miles per hour. But to me, the most interesting thing, if you look at the top sheet, the name for the driver is Clay Reg. So that's Clay Regazzoni. And so these were the practice times for Regazzoni, timed using these Hoyers, September of 1973, so. Yeah, I mean, to me, this board represents everything that, that Hoyer is and, and stood for, and to this day, I think, wants to stand for. You know, this is real performance timing in the truest sense. And I see you even have a few modern Hoyers over there. Yeah, I'm interested in, you know, what Hoyer is, is doing now. This is the first reissue of a Carrera that was in what became known as Jack Hoyer colors. Red accents, the gray. I think this was you know, his favorite color scheme. So Hoyer reissued this one in 2004. This is an aqua racer. I wear every watch in the collection and sometimes you just stand there in the morning and you say, you know, I just want a badass watch. So you could say that this has become such a huge part of your life. You're up in your, your office almost every night, scanning, reading, reporting about the Hoyer community. Right. To me, most of what I'm doing here is tied to the website. Right. And we have an incredibly strong community. The discussion forums and social media and Instagram and Facebook groups, that is one of the huge pleasures of this hobby. And I can't imagine just having the watches without this community. Maybe that's the way it was done before the internet, but you know, that's what makes this, to me, such a great hobby.